Today is day one for the Come Follow Me study for this week, July 15th through the 21st, The Virtue of the Word of God, Alma 30 through 31. Monday, July 15th, 2024, Alma 30, 1 through 11. Children learn through visuals. Visuals will help your children understand better and remember longer what they have been taught. Most of the activities for children in this outline suggest visuals to use. Consider showing the same visuals again in the future to help your children remember what they learned. In this lesson, you will read of a man who is labeled an antichrist. The word itself is a powerful one, conveying images of great wickedness and dedication to evil. If you are to derive the most from this lesson, you must understand the word as it was used by Mormon when he abridged the record of Alma's dealings with Korahor. He says of Korahor, he was antichrist, for he began to preach unto the people against the prophecies which had been spoken by the prophets concerning the coming of Christ. Mormon then includes some detail about the manner of his preaching. Thus it seems that it is the content of his message that earns him this title, and not necessarily some outward, overt behavior. Mormon takes pains to point out that Korhor was not breaking any Nephite law. He was not burning churches or assassinating Christians or stoning prophets. It was what he said more than what he did that earned him the title of Antichrist. The Apostle John used the term in the same way when he said, he is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Then he added, The very Spirit, that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is not of God, and this is that Spirit of Antichrist. And so it is today. To say that a person is Antichrist seems harsh and brutal. Often we see a person who outwardly seems not to warrant such a title. He or she may be law-abiding, well-educated, and seemingly committed to being a good person. People such as this may be examples of achievement and good citizenship in the community. They need not be evil demagogues or members of some clandestine organization trying to overthrow the church. It is what they teach that makes them antichrist. One of the great values of the Book of Mormon is that it helps us to know how to recognize such people when confronted with them. Chapters 30-31 through 31 of Alma identify people and ideas that oppose Jesus Christ. President Ezra Taft Benson said the Book of Mormon brings men to Christ through two basic means. First, it tells in a plain manner of Christ and his gospel. Second, the Book of Mormon exposes the enemies of Christ. It confounds false doctrines and lays down contention. It fortifies the humble followers of Christ against the evil designs, strategies, and doctrines of the devil in our day. The type of apostates in the Book of Mormon are similar to the type we have today. God, with his infinite foreknowledge, so molded the Book of Mormon that we might see the error and know how to combat false educational, political, religious, and philosophical concepts of our time. In the Book of Mormon are keys that will help you detect and protect yourself from the doctrines of the Antichrist. By studying how Korahor sought to destroy the faith of the Nephites, you will better recognize those same destructive arguments in our day. By studying Alma's response to Korahor, you will be better prepared to defend yourself and others from those who would destroy your faith. The accounts in Alma 30 through 31 clearly demonstrate the power of words for evil and for good. The flattering and the great swelling words of a false teacher named Korahor threatened to bring many souls down to destruction. Similarly, the teachings of a Nephite dissenter named Zorm led a whole group of people to fall into great errors and pervert the ways of the Lord. In contrast, Alma had unwavering faith that the word of God would have a more powerful effect upon the minds of the people than the sword or anything else. Alma's words expressed eternal truth and drew upon the powers of Jesus Christ to silence Korahor, and they invited his blessing on those who went with him to bring the Zoramites back to the truth. These are valuable examples for followers of Christ today when false messages are common. We can find truth by trusting, as Alma did, the virtue of the word of God. Chapter 30. Korhor, the Antichrist, ridicules Christ, the Atonement, and the Spirit of Prophecy. He teaches that there is no God, no fall of man, no penalty for sin, and no Christ. Alma testifies that Christ will come, and that all things denote there is a God. Korhor demands a sign and is struck dumb. The devil had appeared to Korhor as an angel and taught him what to say. Korhor is trodden down and dies. About 76 to 74 B.C. Keeping the commandments brings peace. Alma 30, 1-2. 
Behold, now it came to pass that after the people of Ammon were established in the land of Jershon, yea, and also after the Lamanites were driven out of the land, and their dead were buried by the people of the land, now their dead were not numbered because of the greatness of their numbers. Neither were the dead of the Nephites numbered. But it came to pass that they had buried their dead, and also after the days of fasting and mourning and prayer. What is the difference between righteous and unrighteous mourning? Elder Bruce McConkie said, Wholesome and proper mourning, mourning based on sound gospel knowledge, is a profitable and ennobling part of life. Men are commanded to fast and pray and mourn. All these are essential parts of true worship. Mourning takes place in unrighteousness and is displeasing to the Lord when bereaved persons refuse to find comfort and solace in the gospel teachings. Excessive sorrow over the death of a loved one shows spiritual instability. It appears, for example, that the daughters of Ishmael permitted themselves to mourn inordinately over the death of their father. Certainly most of the ritualistic mourning, the elaborate displays of sorrow, the hiring of special mourners, the cutting of the flesh as a sign of sorrow, and so on, are all outside the bounds of decent and dignified mourning. The true gospel perspective is seen in Job's statement, The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Alma 30, 2 continued through 5. And it was the sixteenth year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi. There began to be continual peace throughout all the land. Yea, and the people did observe to keep the commandments of the Lord. And they were strict in observing the ordinances of God according to the law of Moses. For they were taught to keep the law of Moses until it should be fulfilled. And thus the people did have no disturbance in all the sixteenth year of the reign of the judges over the people of Nephi. And it came to pass that in the commencement of the seventeenth year of the reign of the judges, there was continual peace. Men's Beliefs Protected by Law Alma 36 And it came to pass, in the latter end of the seventeenth year, there came a man into the land of Zarahemla, and he was Antichrist, for he began to preach unto the people against the prophecies which had been spoken by the prophets concerning the coming of Christ. In Alma 30, Korhor is called Antichrist. The Bible Dictionary states that an Antichrist is anyone or anything that counterfeits the true gospel or plan of salvation, and that openly or secretly is set up in opposition to Christ. The great Antichrist is Lucifer, but he has many assistants, both in spirit beings and as mortals. Elder Bruce McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles further taught, an Antichrist is an opponent of Christ. He is one who is in opposition to the true gospel, the true church, and the true plan of salvation. He is one who offers salvation to men on some other terms than those laid down by Christ. Sherem, Nahor, and Korhor were Antichrist who spread their delusions among the Nephites. Elder Bruce and Merkonke continued, Many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. John asked, He is an Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Though many modern-day religionists profess to believe in Christ, the fact is they do not accept him as the literal Son of God, and have not turned to him with the full knowledge and devotion necessary to gain salvation. Whosoever receiveth my word receiveth me, he said, and whosoever receiveth me receiveth those the first presidency whom I have sent, whom I have made counselors for my name's sake unto you. The saints in the meridian of time, knowing there would be a great apostasy between their day and the second coming of our Lord, referred to the great apostate church as the Antichrist. Little children, it is the last time, John said, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. This great Antichrist, which is to stand as the antagonist of Christ in the last days, and which is to be overthrown, when he comes to cleanse the earth and usher in millennial righteousness, is the church of the devil, with the man of sin at its head. Some may wonder why the Book of Mormon abridgers left so many accounts of Antichrist. If we remember that the prophets saw our day, it becomes clear that they knew we would face similar attempts to downgrade religion and refute the reality of Jesus Christ. It seems they wanted us to have a clear understanding of the doctrines and purposes of Antichrist.
Look for verses in Alma 36 to 31 that show that Korahor fits this description of an Antichrist. Alma 30, 7 through 11 discusses how civil law relates to agency. Each person is endowed by God with the right to choose his own beliefs. Civil law should ensure that each person has this right. Civil law should also protect a person from those who would deprive him of this agency. Under Nephite law, Korahor was free to believe and speak what he desired, as long as he did not deprive others of their right to do the same. Brigham Young taught that even in the millennium, when all shall bow before Christ and accept him as king, people will still be allowed to have agency and choose how they wish to worship. They will ask, If I bow the knee and confess that he is that Savior, the Christ, to the glory of the Father, will you let me go home and be a Presbyterian? Yes. And not persecute me? Never. Won't you let me go home and belong to the Greek church? Yes. Will you allow me to be a friend Quaker or a shaking Quaker? Oh yes, anything you wish to be, but remember that you must not persecute your neighbors, but must mind your own business and let your neighbors alone, and let them worship the sun, moon, a white dog, or anything else they please, being mindful that every knee has got to bow and every tongue confess. When you have paid this tribute to the Most High who created you and preserves you, you may then go and worship what you please, or do what you please, if you do not infringe upon your neighbors. Brigham Young also taught that the kingdom of God will be the means of protecting this freedom of worship. Alma 30, 7 through 11. Now there was no law against a man's belief, for it was strictly contrary to the commandments of God that there should be a law which should bring men on to unequal grounds. For thus saith the scripture, Choose you this day whom ye will serve. Now if a man desired to serve God, it was his privilege, or rather, if he believed in God, it was his privilege to serve him. But if he did not believe in him, there was no law to punish him. But if he murdered, he was punished unto death. And if he robbed, he was also punished. And if he stole, he was also punished. And if he committed adultery, he was also punished. Yea, for all this wickedness, they were punished. For there was a law that men should be judged according to their crimes. Nevertheless, there was no law against a man's belief. Therefore, a man was punished only for the crimes which he had done. Therefore, all men were on equal grounds. If there was no law against a man's belief, some people might ask why Korhor was arrested. King Mosiah had issued a proclamation declaring that it was against Nephite law for any unbeliever to persecute any of those who belonged to the Church of God. Clearly, Korhor was entitled to his beliefs, but when he sought to destroy the Church, he broke King Mosiah's proclamation. It is interesting to note that whereas many in Zarahemla embraced Korhor and his teachings, the people of Ammon, who had lived most of their lives following Korhor-like beliefs, caused that he should be carried out of the land. They understood the dangers of Korhor's teachings. Today is day two for the Come Follow Me study for this week, July 15th through the 21st, The Virtue of the Word of God, Alma 30-31. through 31. Tuesday, July 16th, 2024, Alma 30, 12 through 18. The Diabolical Doctrines of an Antichrist. President Ezra Taft Benson has taught us repeatedly that the Book of Mormon was written for our day. He writes, The Nephites never had the book, neither did the Lamanites of ancient times. It was meant for us. Mormon wrote, Near the end of the Nephite civilization, under the inspiration of God, who sees all things from the beginning, he abridged centuries of records, choosing the stories, speeches, and events that would be most helpful to us. Each of the major writings of the Book of Mormon testified that he wrote for future generations. If they saw our day and chose those things which would be of greatest worth to us, is not that how we should study the Book of Mormon? We should constantly ask ourselves, why did the Lord inspire Mormon or Moroni or Alma to include that in his record? What lesson can I learn from that to help me live in this day and age? Elder Gerald N. Lund, formerly of the Seventy, explained that Korhor has many modern-day equivalents. Today, the world is permeated with philosophies similar to those taught by Korhor. We read them in books, see them championed in the movies and on television, and hear them taught in classrooms and sometimes in the churches of our time. We see clear evidence of Mormon's inspiration to give us a full account of Korhor and his teachings. Korhor's teachings are old doctrine, and yet they are ideas as modern as today's high-speed printing presses and satellite dishes. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, Clever but pathetic Korhor surely 
has his modern counterparts, especially in today's settings, in which so many people are especially free to choose for themselves. In his time, as in ours, there was no law against a man's belief, for it was strictly contrary to the commands of God. A modern experience. Howe had come to the university from a small Arizona community. He was an exceptionally good student, and he registered for a heavy schedule his freshman year. The schedule included a philosophy of religion course from Professor Cochran. Hal was not prepared for the engaging professor who was distinguished in appearance, soft-spoken in manner, kindly in demeanor, and very rationally persuasive. The professor opened the first day of class in the following manner. I should like to dispel any illusions that some of you may have that this is a course in religion. You will note by the course title that it is a philosophy of religion course. We shall proceed with emphasis on the philosophy aspect. I am quite sensitive to the fact that some of you profess orthodox Christian views. While I respect your right to those views, it is one of the functions of this course to rigorously examine traditional religion and expose you to several other rational alternatives. Personally, my own experiences have caused me to develop a philosophy that has its database in more demonstrative evidence than faith responses. I desire first that you'd clearly understand my biases, and though it is not my intention to dissuade you in your personal belief, I must forewarn you that many of the students who enroll in this course find occasion to abandon such beliefs. This is always emotionally traumatic, especially to parents. If you feel that your beliefs may not withstand scrutiny, perhaps it would be well that you drop the class. Through the coming days, Hal soon learned that the professor's opening remarks were but a prelude to one attack after another on all he had believed. They spent one whole hour on the origin of God, with the professor showing how gods were the product of men's own need to worship something higher than themselves. He showed how earlier in the history of Israel, when they were still basically a primitive people, their God was a primitive, blood-loving deity, and only as they became more civilized and sophisticated did God finally mellow until he became a loving father who sacrificed his son for mankind. Hal and others in the class objected, but the professor quoted several Old Testament passages to prove his point. Hal couldn't think of a satisfactory answer and finally lapsed into silence. Another day, the entire period was spent emphasizing how the only real base for knowledge was man's own perceptual experience. A scientist may ask you to believe many things, the professor said, but you yourself can duplicate his experiments and prove his validity. But when a religionist asks you to have faith in God, you cannot find out for yourself except through an unprovable and duplicated experience. In other words, you cannot see, hear, feel, smell, or taste faith, God, salvation, or any other basic con concepts of religion. And so it went, day after day in the class. Hal soon learned to keep quiet, for he always ended up feeling like a fool when Professor Cochran answered his objections. It was not that the professor was rude or cruel in any way. He just talked circles around Hal. They talked about the contradictions between science and the beliefs of religion, including such things as evolution, the fall of man, the age of the earth, the universal flood, and so on. Studying Korhor's false teachings can help you recognize and reject similar teachings. The following activities may help in your study. What object lessons can you think of to better understand the difference between the Savior's teachings and Satan's false imitations? Some examples are a lure used for fishing fake money, and false advertising. Consider displaying some items such as money or food and toy imitations of these items. This could lead to a discussion about how to know the difference between things that are real and things that are false. How can you tell if something is fake? How can you recognize truth? Consider making a list of the false doctrines Korhor taught in Alma 30, 12-31. Alma 30, 12-13. And this Antichrist, whose name was Korhor, and the law could have no hold upon him, began to preach unto the people that there should be no Christ. And after this manner did he preach, saying, O ye that are bound down under a foolish and a vain hope, why do you yoke yourselves with such foolish things? President Ezra Taft Benson said, One of Satan's frequently used deceptions is the notion that the commandments of God are meant to restrict freedom and limit happiness. Young people especially sometimes feel that the standards of the Lord are like fences and chains, blocking them from those activities that seem most enjoyable in life. But exactly the opposite is true. 
The gospel plan is the plan by which men are brought to a fullness of joy. The gospel principles are the steps and guidelines which will help us find true happiness and joy. Alma 30, 13 continued, Why do ye look for Christ? For no man can know of anything which is to come. Core Horse Teachings No man can know of things to come. Professor Cochran's Teachings Shall we trust only our senses and evidence that can be objectively measured? Or should we place our confidence in subjective faith feelings and a supposed clairvoyance about the future called prophecy, neither of which can be proven by physical means? Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, and some many maintain that we simply cannot know the future, that angels do not minister to man, and furthermore, that we cannot accept the word of those who testify otherwise. For some, this amounts to an article of faith. We find insufficient evidence for belief in the existence of a supernatural. It is either meaningless or irrelevant to the question of the survival and fulfillment of the human race. As non-theists, we begin with humans, not God, nature, not deity. No deity will save us. We must save ourselves. Fortunately, as Latter-day Saints, we know better, having been blessed with the witness of the Spirit. Alma 30, 14. Behold these things which ye call prophecies, which ye say are handed down by holy prophets. Behold, they are foolish traditions of your fathers. Core Horse Teachings, Prophecy and Religious Beliefs are Foolish Traditions. Professor Cochran's Teachings. We know that the religion was, first of all, the worship of a multitude of gods. Finally, after nearly three weeks of it, Hal decided to ask for an appointment with Brother Simpson, his institute teacher. When Hal introduced his problem, Brother Simpson replied, As you can probably guess, Hal, this is not the first time one of our students has had a problem with P Professor Cochran. They talked for nearly an hour discussing some of the teachings with which Hal was wrestling. Brother Simpson then said, Actually, Hal, there is nothing new about these arguments. In fact, the Book of Mormon indicates that they were skillfully used centuries ago. Where does it say that? inquired Hal. Here, let me show you. Have you ever heard of a fellow named Korhor? Yeah, I remember talking about him briefly in seminary, replied Hal. You remember that he tried to convince the people that there was no Christ. Let's read the account. Alma thirty fifteen. How do ye know of their surety? Behold, ye cannot know of things which ye do not see. Therefore, ye cannot know that there shall be a Christ. Korhor's teachings. Ye cannot know of things which ye do not see. Professor Cochran's teachings. Through what channel does man obtain knowledge? Is it not through his sensory perception that reality is discerned? Should we place our confidence in subjective faith feelings that cannot be proven by physical means? Poor horse teaching that ye cannot know of things which ye do not see is the philosophy that all ideas and knowledge are derived from and can be tested by experience, and that we can only know those things we experience through our senses, sight, smell, touch, hearing, or taste. Since spiritual experiences involving revelation from God rarely pass through the senses of sight, smell, touch, hearing, or taste, those who hold to Korhor's philosophy count them as meaningless. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, described the experience he had that illustrated the fact that spiritual matters do not typically include the common five senses. I would tell you of an experience I had before I was a general authority, which affected me profoundly. I sat on a plane next to a professed atheist who pressed his disbelief in God so urgently that I bore my testimony to him. You are wrong, I said. There is a God. I know he lives. He protested. You don't know. Nobody knows that. You can't know it. When I will not yield, the atheist, who was an attorney, asked perhaps the ultimate question on the subject of testimony. All right, he said in a sneering, condescending way. You say you know. Tell me how you know. When I attempted to answer, even though I held advanced academic degrees, I was helpless to communicate. Sometimes in your youth, you young missionaries are embarrassed when the cynic, the skeptic, treat you with contempt because you do not have ready answers for everything. Before such ridicule, some turn away in shame. Remember the iron rod, the spacious building, and the mocking? When I used the word spirit and witness, the atheist responded, I don't know what you are talking about. The words prayer, discernment, and faith were equally meaningless to him. You see, he said, you don't really know. If you did, you would be able to tell me how you know. I felt perhaps that I had borne my testimony to him unwisely and was at a loss as of what to do. Then came the experience. 
something came to my mind, and I mention here a statement of the prophet Joseph Smith. A person may profit by noticing the first intimation of the spirit by revelation, for instance, when you feel pure intelligence flowing into you. It may give you sudden strokes of ideas. And thus, by learning the spirit of God and understanding it, you may grow into the principle of revelation, until you become perfect in Christ Jesus. Such an idea came into my mind, and I said to the atheist, Let me ask if you know what salt tastes like. Of course I do, was his reply. When did you taste salt last? I just had dinner on the plane. You just think you know what salt tastes like, I said. He insisted. I know what salt tastes like, as well as I know anything. If I give you a cup of salt and a cup of sugar and let you taste them both, could you tell the salt from the sugar? Now you are getting juvenile, was his reply. Of course I could tell the difference. I know what salt tastes like. It is an everyday experience. I know it as well as I know anything. Then I said, assuming that I have never tasted salt, explain to me just what it tastes like. After some thought, he ventured, well, I, uh, it's not sweet, and it is not sour. You've told me what it isn't. Not what it is. After several attempts, of course, he could not do it. He could not convey, in words alone, so ordinary an experience as tasting salt. I bore testimony to him once again and said, I know there is a God. You ridiculed my testimony and said that if I did know, I would be able to tell you exactly how I know. My friend, spiritually speaking, I have tasted salt. I am no more able to convey to you in words how this knowledge has come than you are to tell me what salt tastes like. But I say to you again, there is a God. He does live. And just because you don't know, don't try to tell me that I don't know, for I do. As we parted, I heard him mutter, I don't need your religion for a crutch. I don't need it. From that experience forward, I have never been embarrassed or ashamed that I could not explain in words alone everything I know spiritually. President Russell M. Nelson gave the following counsel about knowing that God exists. Understand that in the absence of experiences with God, one can doubt the existence of God. So put yourself in a position to begin having experiences with Him. Humble yourself. Pray to have eyes to see God's hand in your life and in the world around you. Ask Him to tell you if He is really there, if He knows you. Ask Him how He feels about you. And then listen. Bishop Keith B. McMullen said, A millennium of experience through sight, sound, touch, taste, smell, and all the powers of the universe combined cannot approach the sublime and complete experience of one brief moment under the influence of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a spirit personage. He has power to speak to the spirit of every man and woman, boy and girl. His message is conveyed with absolute certainty. This revealed knowledge constitutes a personal testimony and witness of the truth. Alma 30, 16, you look forward and say that ye see a remission of your sins, but behold, it is the effect of a frenzied mind, and this derangement of your minds comes because of the traditions of your fathers, which lead you away into a belief of things which are not so. Core Horse Teachings It is the effect of a frenzied mind, a derangement of your minds. Professor Cochran's Teachings I consider so-called spiritual phenomena to be essentially psychological in their origin. In some cases, these phenomena are clearly a manifestation of emotional maladjustment. Alma 30, 17, and many more such things did he say unto them, telling them that there could be no atonement made for the sins of men. But every man fared in his life according to the management of the creature. Therefore, every man prospered according to his genius, and that every man conquered according to his strength, and whatsoever a man did was no crime. Horse teachings. There could be no atonement because every man fares in this life according to the management of the creature, prospers according to his genius, and conquers according to his strengths. Professor Cochrane's teachings, the law of natural selection is the law of trial and error, which only the fittest survive by adoption, by adaptation to the environment. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, some who do not acknowledge God, and for that matter some who do, proceed through life insensitively. Like Korhor, they apparently believe that in this life we fare only according to the individual management of the creature, and that every one conquers according to his genius or strength. To the strong, this seems ideal, but what of the conquered and subdued? Injustice multiplies like insects in the sunshine. Hugh Nibley said, when you talk about the management of the creature, that's a perfect expression. It's the manipulation of people, as if they were items or products. 
You can manipulate everything with the psychology of salesmanship. It is the manipulation, the management of the creature. Korhor's philosophy that a person prospers according to his genius and that every man conquered according to his strength precludes the necessity of God in our life. His philosophy that whatsoever a man did was no crime would create a self-centered and relative value system in man. Elder D. Todd Christopherson said, People such as Korhor deny the very existence of Christ and such thing as sin. Their doctrine is that values, standards, and even truth are all relative. Thus, whatever one feels is right for him or her cannot be judged by others to be wrong or sinful. On the surface, such philosophies seem appealing because they give us license to indulge any appetite or desire without concern for consequences. Despite what some people in the world believe, the gospel teaches that there is no such thing as a relative value system. Some cultures seem to allow or even encourage this value-free approach to life encouraging subtle forms of dishonesty in government, business, and personal relations. The Book of Mormon teaches us, however, that there is a right and wrong and gives us the key by which to judge. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles exposes the selfishness in Korahor's teachings. Some of the selfish wrongly believe that there is no divine law anyway, so there is no sin. Situational ethics are thus made to order for the selfish. So in the management of self, one can conquer by his genius and strength, because there really is no crime whatsoever. Unsurprisingly, therefore, selfishness leads to terrible perpetual and behavioral blunders. For instance, Cain, corrupted by the seeking of power, said after slaying Abel, I am free. One of the worst consequences of severe selfishness, therefore, is this profound loss of proportionality like straining at gnats while swallowing camels. Today there are, for example, those who strain over various gnats, but swallow the practice of partial birth abortions. Small wonder, therefore, that selfishness magnifies a mess of pottage into a banquet and makes 30 pieces of silver look like a treasure trove. What are the three arguments used by Korhor that there would be no Christ? I'll continue. You know, those are almost the same arguments Professor Cochran has used on us. As I say how, there is nothing new about them. Why don't you study Alma 30? Take out a piece of paper and list the arguments of Korhor. As you continue to work through this exercise and compare the philosophy of Professor Cochran to those of Korhor, then let's get together for some further discussion. Alma 30, 18. And thus he did preach unto them, leading away the hearts of many, causing them to lift up their heads in their wickedness. Yea, leading away many women, and also men, to commit whoredoms, telling them that when a man was dead, that was the end thereof. Korhor's teachings. When a man is dead, that is the end thereof. Professor Cochran's teachings. Many unwilling to face the inevitability of death persist in the naive notion of a life beyond. President Joseph F. Smith said, Some people cannot think of anything else but annihilation. What a glorious prospect for the sinner! Then he could say, Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and next day we will be annihilated, and that will be the end of our sorrow and of God's judgment upon us. Do not flatter yourselves that you are going to get out of it so easy. This Book of Mormon is replete all the way through with the testimonies of the servants of God that men are born to be immortal, that after the resurrection their bodies are to live as long as their spirits, and their spirits cannot die. They are immortal beings. And they are destined, if they commit the unpardonable sin, to be banished from the presence of God and endure the punishment of the devil and his angels throughout all eternity. I think the wicked would prefer annihilation to the suffering of such punishment. That would be an end to punishment and an end to being. This view cannot be reconciled with the word of God. Hugh Nibley said, That is no hope for anything future, no hope of anything hereafter, that this is all there is. That's what nihilism is. There is no more. That is all there is. Don't expect anything else. As we said before, una perpetua nox dormienda. One perpetual black night awaits us, and that's all. Since this is all there is, we act that way. That is nihilism. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, Many in the world hold back from making the leap of faith because they have already jumped to the Korhor conclusions, such as God never was nor ever will be, there is no redeeming Christ. Man cannot know the future. 
man cannot know that of which he cannot see. Whatsoever a man does is no crime, and death is the end. One basic limitation of worldly wisdom is that lack of longitudinality and of precious perspective. Worldly wisdom cannot see afar off, and without a spiritual memory and spiritual will, past mistakes are repeated and folly is resumed. One gospel scholar explained how closely Korhor's philosophy aligns with many modern philosophies. Hugh Nibley said Korhor insisted on a strictly rational and scientific approach to all problems, anything else being but the effect of a frenzied mind. He crusaded against the tyranny of ancient traditions and primitive superstitions, which led people to believe things which just are not so. Calling for an emancipation from the silly traditions of their fathers, he called for a new morality with the shedding of old inhibitions. He called for economic liberation from priestly exploitation, demanding that all be free to make use of that which is their own. He preached a strict nonsense naturalism. When a man was dead, that was the end thereof. And its corollary, which was a strict materialism, every man fared in his life according to the management of the creature. From this followed a clear-cut philosophy of laissez-faire. Therefore, every man prospereth according to his genius, and every man conquered according to his strength, with right and wrong measured only by nature's iron rule of success and failure, and whatsoever a man did was no crime. It was survival of the fittest applied to human behavior, and the removal of old moral and sentimental restraints was good news to many people, causing them to lift up their heads in their wickedness, yea, leading many away to commit whoredoms. Along with this attitude of emancipation, Korahor cultivated a crusading zeal and intolerance of any opposition, which has been thoroughly characteristic of his school of thought in modern times, calling all opposition foolish, silly, and the evidence of frenzied and deranged minds. And while, for Alma, a free society was one in which anybody could think and say whatever he chose, for Korahor the only free society was one in which everyone thought exactly as he thought. Hugh Nibley continued, the philosophy of Korhor, with its naturalism, materialism, and moral relativism, is the prevailing philosophy of our own day, as was foreseen in the Book of Mormon. Yea, there shall be great pollutions upon the face of the earth, when there shall be many who will say, Do this or do that, and it mattereth not, for the Lord will uphold such at the last day. But woe unto such, for they are in the gall of bitterness, and in the bonds of iniquity. Enormously proud of their accomplishments, the Gentiles are lifted up in the pride of their eyes and have stumbled because of the greatness of their stumbling block. Their own expertise is the highest court of appeal, as they preach up unto themselves their own wisdom and their own learning, that they may get gain and grind upon the faces of the poor, that theologians set themselves up for a light unto the world, that they may get gain and praise of the world, as they contend one with another, teach with their learning, and deny the Holy Ghost. What were some of the false teachings of Korahor? Explain to a friend why such arguments ultimately fail. Which of Korahor's teachings might be enticing today? Why would Korahor's teachings seem attractive to certain individuals? What are some examples of such teachings today? How do Korhor's teachings fit the arguments used to attack our faith in these days? What harm can result from accepting such ideas? Today is day three for the Come Follow Me study for this week, July 15th through the 21st. The Virtue of the Word of God, Alma 30-31 Wednesday, July 17th, 2024 Alma 30, 19-42 The Nephites confront Korhor, Alma 30, 19-22 Now this man went over to the land of Jershon also to preach these things among the people of Ammon, who were once the people of the Lamanites. But behold, they were more wise than many of the Nephites, for they took him and bound him and carried him before Ammon who was a high priest over that people. And it came to pass that he caused that he should be carried out of the land, and he came over into the land of Gideon, and began to preach unto them also, 
and here he did not have much success, for he was taken and bound and carried before the high priest and also the chief judge over the land. And it came to pass that the high priest said unto him, Why do ye go about perverting the ways of the Lord? Why do ye teach this people that there shall be no Christ? To interrupt their rejoicings, why do ye speak against all the prophecies of the holy prophets? President Russell M. Nelson said, As we diligently focus on the Savior, and then follow his pattern of focusing on joy, we need to avoid those things that can interrupt our joy. Remember Korhor, the Antichrist, spewing falsehoods about the Savior. Korhor went from place to place until he was brought before a high priest who asked him, Why do ye go about perverting the ways of the Lord? Why do you teach this people that there shall be no Christ to interrupt their rejoicings? Anything that opposes Christ or his doctrine will interrupt our joy. That includes the philosophies of men so abundant online and in the blogosphere, which do exactly what Korhor did. If we look to the world and follow its formulas for happiness, we will never know joy. Alma thirty twenty three. Now the high priest's name was Gadona, and Korhor said unto him, because I do not teach the foolish traditions of your fathers, and because I do not teach this people to bind themselves down under the foolish ordinances and performances which are laid down by ancient priests, to usurp power and authority over them, to keep them in ignorance, that they may not lift up their heads, but be brought down according to thy words. The high priest Gadona confronted Korhor and asked him why he spoke against the prophets and against the reality of Jesus Christ. Korhor evaded the question and mounted a verbal attack against the believers and their leaders. He sought to make it appear foolish for anyone to follow their ecclesiastic leaders. President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency taught to the contrary. Korhor was arguing, as men and women have falsely argued from the beginning of time, that to take counsel from the servants of God is to surrender God-given rights of independence. But the argument is false because it misrepresents reality. When we reject the counsel which comes from God, we do not choose to be independent of outside influence. We choose another influence. We reject the protection of a perfectly loving, all-powerful, all-knowing Father in heaven, whose whole purpose, as that of his beloved Son, is to give us eternal life, to give us all that he has, and to bring us home again in families to the arms of his love. In rejecting his counsel, we choose the influence of another power, whose purpose is to make us miserable and whose motive is hatred. We have moral agency as a gift of God, rather than the right to choose to be free of influence. It is the inalienable right to submit ourselves to whichever of those powers we choose. Another fallacy is to believe that the choice to accept or not accept the counsel of a prophet is no more than deciding whether to accept good advice and gain its benefits or to stay where we are. But the choice not to take prophetic counsel changes the very ground upon which we stand. It becomes more dangerous. The failure to take prophetic counsel lessens our power to take inspired counsel in the future. The best time to have decided to help Noah build the ark was the first time he asked. Each time he asked after that, each failure to respond would have lessened sensitivity to the spirit. And so each time his request would have seemed more foolish until the rain came. And then it was too late. President Spencer W. Kimball said, It is a real travesty today when we hear the voices of the atheist, the godless, and the antichrist who would deny us the right of public expression of our worship of the Master. First, they moved against the long-established institution of prayer in our public schools. They would remove any vestige of Christianity or worship of the Savior of mankind in our public gatherings. They would remove the In God We Trust insignia from our nation's emblems and seals and from our national coins. The latest move of these antichrists would prohibit our own children from singing the beautiful and inspiring Christmas carols relating to our Savior's birth, or divinity, or the heavenly angels singing from our public schools. Elder Joseph B. Worthland said, Isn't it interesting that these groups consider it freedom of expression to profane the Lord's name and use obscenities, but oppose prayer in public places? These groups combat public faith in prayer, yet uphold the right of anyone to have an abortion. Alma 30, 24-25 Ye say that this people is a free people. Behold, I say they are in bondage. Ye say that those ancient prophecies are true. Behold, I say that ye do not know that they are true. Ye say that this people is a guilty and a fallen people because of the transgression of a parent. Behold, I say that a child is not guilty because of its parents. Antichrists often use half-truths. A common tactic 
used by those who are trying to destroy faith is called a straw man argument. This is done by setting up a false image, a straw man of the truth, and then attacking the false image in order to convince others the true image is false. A simple example of this is a child accusing parents who won't let him play until he gets his work done of not wanting him to have any fun. This is faulty reasoning, but it is often used to deceive others. Sometimes others claim that Latter-day Saints believe something that they don't believe. They claim that the false belief is false and then show it is false. It has nothing to do with what we really believe, but it is an attempt to make us seem to be in error. Forhor did this to Gedona. This argument is called a straw man. That is, he attributed to Gedona something that Gedona does not believe, the idea that children inherit guilt through Adam's transgression. Horhor knows that he cannot fight truth fairly and come off victorious, so he attributes bad doctrine to Gedona, a straw man to which he can give a good verbal licking. Alma 30, 26-28 And ye also say that Christ shall come, but behold, I say that ye do not know that there shall be a Christ, and ye say also that he shall be slain for the sins of the world. And thus ye lead away this people after the foolish traditions of your fathers, and according to your own desires, and ye keep them down, even as it were in bondage, that ye may glut yourselves with the labors of their hands, that they durst not look up with boldness, and that they durst not enjoy their rights and privileges. Yea, they durst not make use of that which is their own, lest they should offend their priests, who do yoke them according to their desires, and have brought them to believe by their traditions and their dreams and their whims and their visions and their pretended mysteries, that they should, if they did not do according to their words, offend some unknown being, who they say is God, a being who never has been seen or known, who never was nor ever will be. Imputing evil motives to church leaders as Korhor did was also used by the wicked Nephites in discounting the prophecies of Samuel the Lamanite. Horhor then denounced the fall, the atonement, and revelation, some of the most basic doctrines of the kingdom of God. Which of Korhor's teachings might be enticing today? What harm can result from accepting such ideas? What false messages is the adversary using to try to deceive you today? Alma 30, 29. Now when the high priest and the chief judge saw the hardness of his heart, yea, when they saw that he would revile even against God, they would not make any reply to his words, but they caused that he should be bound, and they delivered him up into the hands of the officers and sent him to the land of Zarahemla, that he might be brought before Alma and the chief judge, who was governor over all the land. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that we should avoid contention, let the elders be exceedingly careful about unnecessarily disturbing and harrowing up the feelings of the people. Remember that your business is to preach the gospel in all humility and meekness, and warn sinners to repent and come to Christ. Avoid contentions and vain disputes with men of corrupt minds, who do not desire to know the truth. Remember that it is a day of warning, and not a day of many words. If they receive not your testimony in one place, flee to another remembering to cast no reflections, nor throw out any bitter sayings. If you do your duty, it will be just as well with you as though all men embraced the gospel. Alma testifies to Korhor of the truth. Alma 30, 30. And it came to pass that when he was brought before Alma and the chief judge, he did go on in the same manner as he did in the land of Gideon. Yea, he went on to blaspheme. The word blaspheme, as used in Alma 3030, means to speak evil of or to revile against God. Elder Bruce at McConkie said blasphemy consists in either or both of the following. 1. Speaking irreverently, evilly, abusively, or scurriously against God or sacred things. Or 2. Speaking profanely or falsely about deity. Among a great host of impious and sacrilegious speaking that constitute blasphemy are such things as taking the name of God in vain, evil speaking about the Lord's anointed, belittling sacred temple ordinances or patriarchal blessings or sacramental administrations, claiming unwarranted divine authority, and promulgating with profane piety a false system of salvation. Alma 30, 31-36, And he did rise up 
in great swelling words before Alma and did revile against the priests and teachers, accusing them of leading away the people after the silly traditions of their fathers, for the sake of glutting on the labors of the people. Now Alma said unto him, Thou knowest that we do not glut ourselves upon the labors of this people, for behold, I have labored even from the commencement of the reign of the judges until now, with mine own hands for my support, notwithstanding my many travels round about the land to declare the word of God to, unto my people. And notwithstanding the many labors which I have performed in the church, I have never received so much as even one senine for my labor. Neither has any of my brethren, save it were in the judgment seat. And then we have received only according to law for our time. And now, if we do not receive anything for our labors in the church, what doth it profit us to labor in the church, save it were to declare the truth, that we may have rejoicings in the joy of our brethren? Then why sayest thou that we preach unto this people to get gain, when thou of thyself knowest that we receive no gain? And now believest thou that we deceive this people that causes such joy in their hearts? And Korahor answered him, Yea. Note how Alma explained to Korahor that one of the evidences of truthfulness of the gospel was the joy it produced in the hearts of the people. In Alma 30, 32-35, how did Alma respond to the lies or false teachings that Korahor taught about God? What do we learn from his example? A few days later, after Hal again sought Brother Simpson's help, Hal related to him how Professor Cochran had challenged the existence of God. Did anyone accept the challenge? asked Brother Simpson. I think he has us all intimidated, replied Hal. What was his evidence that there was no God? asked Brother Simpson. You know, he didn't mention any. He placed the whole burden of proof on us. Exactly. By keeping you on the defensive, he does not have to produce any evidence. Do you remember how Alma handled a similar experience? Not exactly, replied Hal. Let's look at it. Alma 30, 37-39 And then Alma said unto him, Believest thou that there is a God? And he answered, Nay. Now Alma said unto him, Will ye deny again that there is a God, and also deny the Christ? For behold, I say unto you, I know there is a God, and also that Christ shall come. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained one way to respond to an Antichrist. Korhor ridiculed the foolish and silly traditions of believing in a Christ who shall come. Korhor's arguments sound very contemporary to the modern reader, but Alma used a timeless and ultimately undeniable weapon in response, the power of personal testimony. Angry that Korhor and his life were essentially against happiness, Gedona the high priest asked, Why do you teach this people that there shall be no Christ, to interrupt their rejoicings? I know there is a God. Alma 30.40 and now what evidence have ye that there is no God, or that Christ cometh not? I say unto you, that ye have none, save it be your word only. What evidence did Korhor have that there was no God? Brother Simpson continued, You see, Korhor, like many modern-day skeptics, denied that reality which lay beyond his natural senses. He apparently accepted only those things which he could perceive through his physical senses. Elder Gerald N. Lunn explained the impossibility of proving that there is no God. When questioned, Korhor categorically denies that he believes that there is a God. Alma then asks, What evidence have ye that there is no God, or that Christ cometh not? I say unto you that ye have none, save it be your word only. It is an inspired insight on Alma's part. Korhor is not consistent in his own thinking. If we truly can know only those things for which we have empirical evidence, then we cannot teach there is no God unless we have evidence for that belief. And Korhor has no evidence. Korhor will consider only evidence that can be gathered through the senses. In such a system, it is much easier to prove there is a God than to prove there is not a God. To prove there is a God, all it takes is for one person to hear, see, or otherwise have an experience with God, and thereafter the existence of God cannot be disproved. But here is what it would take to prove there is no God. Since God is not confined to this earth, we would have to search throughout the universe for him. We assume God is able to move about. So it would not be enough to start at point A in the universe and search through to point Z. 
What if after we leave point A, God moves there and stays there for the rest of the search? In other words, for Korhor to say that there is no God, based on the very criteria he himself has established, he would have to perceive every cubic meter of the universe simultaneously. This creates a paradox. In order for Korhor to prove there is no God, he would have to be a God himself. Therefore, in declaring there is no God, he is acting on faith, the very thing for which he so sharply derides the religious leaders. Elder Gerald N. Lund continued, No wonder Mormon chose to detail the story of Korhor. It teaches a great lesson for our day. No matter how clever, how sophisticated the philosophies of an antichrist may seem, they are not true. They are riddled with contradictions, errors, and false assumptions. The gospel, on the other hand, is truth. Truth that has stood the test of centuries. Truth that can withstand rational examination. Truth that is pragmatic and practical. Truth that can be confirmed through personal experience. A believer need not apologize for his or her beliefs. For these beliefs would stand every scrutiny much more efficiently than do the doctrines of Satan. Alma 30, 41-42 But behold, I have all things as a testimony that these things are true, and ye also have all things as a testimony unto you that they are true. And will ye deny them? Believest thou that these things are true? Behold, I know that thou believest, but thou art possessed with the lying spirit, and ye have put off the Spirit of God, that it may have no place in you, but the devil has power over you, and he doth carry you about, working devices, that he may destroy the children of God. Amulek will later explain to the Zoramites, Alma 34, If ye have procrastinated the day of your repentance, even unto death, behold, ye have become subjected to the spirit of the devil, and he doth seal you his. Therefore the spirit of the Lord hath withdrawn from you, and hath no place in you, and the devil hath all power over you. Today is day four for the Come Follow Me study for this week, July 15th through the 21st, The Virtue of the Word of God, Alma 30-31. Thursday, July 18th, 2024, Alma 30, 43-60. Faith comes by hearkening, not by signs. Alma 30, 43. And now Korhor said unto Alma, If thou wilt show me a sign, that I may be convinced that there is a God, yea, show unto me that he hath power, and then will I be convinced of the truth of thy words. Brother Simpson continued, Alma offers his testimony that there is a God. His first evidence was given in Alma 30, 39, in his personal testimony. In verse 44, he identifies three other evidences available to himself and Korahor. If possible, take a walk outside with your children, or stand at a window as you read Alma 30, 44. But Alma said unto him, Thou hast had signs enough. Will ye tempt your God? Will ye say, Show unto me a sign? When ye have the testimony of all these thy brethren, and also all the holy prophets, the scriptures are laid before thee. Yea, in all things denote there is a God. Yea, even the earth, and all things that are upon the face of it. Yea, in its motion. Yea, and also all the planets which move in the regular form do witness that there is a supreme creator. When Korhor asked for a sign of God's existence, what signs did Alma put forth as evidence that God lives? Alma talked about how things in the sky and on the earth testify that God lives. Ask your children to point out things they see that help them know that God is real and that he loves them. You can also draw pictures of things they discover. While you and your children sing, My Heavenly Father Loves Me, pass around a ball or other object. Periodically stop the music and ask the child holding the object to share one thing Heavenly Father created that he or she is grateful for. Alma first asked Korhor to give evidence that God did not exist, and Korhor could not give his evidence. Alma then gave the following evidence for God's existence. Alma's own personal testimony, the testimonies of members of the church, the testimonies of the prophets, the earth and all things upon it, the order of the universe. Speaking of the last two evidences, Elder Gordon B. Hinckley said, Can any man who has walked beneath the stars at night, can anyone who has seen the touch of spring upon the land, doubt the hand of divinity in creation? So observing the beauties of the earth, one is wont to speak, as did the psalmist. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. All of beauty 
in the earth bears the fingerprint of the master creator. Elder Anne Russell Ballard said, astronauts viewing the earth from space have stated how incredibly beautiful it is and how alive it appears. United States Senator Jake Garn wrote of his experience in space. It is impossible for me to describe the beauty of the earth. It is a breathtaking, awe-inspiring spiritual experience to view the earth from space while traveling at 25 times the speed of sound. I could also look into the blackness of the vacuum of space and see billions of stars and galaxies millions of light years away. The universe is so vast as to be impossible to comprehend. But I did comprehend the hand of God in all things. I felt his presence throughout my seven days of space. I know that God created this earth and the universe. I know that we are his children wherever we live on the earth, without regard to our nationality or the color of our skin. Most important, I know that God lives and is the creator of us all. Again, the words of the hymn came to mind. O Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art. How have these evidences helped strengthen your faith? Write a paragraph that briefly explains how the design and order in the universe is evidence of God's existence. List at least three approaches Alma used to refute Korhor's attack on the true church. How can we similarly be ready to defend the truth? Alma 30, 45-46 And yet ye do go about, leading away the hearts of this people, testifying unto them, There is no God. And yet will ye deny against all these witnesses? And he said, Yea, I will deny, except ye shall show me a sign. And now it came to pass that Alma said unto him, Behold, I am grieved because of the hardness of your heart. Yea, that ye will still resist the spirit of the truth, that thy soul may be destroyed. President James E. Fowle said, Each of us needs to nourish our seeds of faith so that they continue to take root. Yet, at the same time, the ground seems to be hardening, and many are less receptive to things of the spirit. The miracles of modern technology have brought efficiency into our lives in ways not dreamed of a generation ago. Yet, with this new technology has come a deluge of new challenges to our morals and our values. Some tend to rely more on technology than on theology. We also need to prepare our own seabed of faith. To do this, we need to plow the soil through daily humble prayer, asking for strength and forgiveness. There is no better place for the spiritual seeds of our faith to be nurtured than within the hallowed sanctuaries of our temples and in our homes. Many people today believe that there is no God. What do you find in Alma 30, 39-46? that helps you know that God is real. What prevents us from knowing him? What other testimonies has God given you that he lives? Alma 30, 47 through 48. But behold, it is better that thy soul should be lost than that thou shouldest be the means of bringing many souls down to destruction. By thy lying and by thy flattering words, Therefore, if thou shalt deny again, behold, God shall smite thee, that thou shalt become dumb, that thou shalt never open thy mouth any more, that thou shalt not deceive this people any more. Now Korhor said unto him, I do not deny the existence of a God, but I do not believe that there is a God. Korhor's teaching, I do not believe that there is a God. Professor Cochran's teachings, surely you can understand why one in my position is compelled to ascribe the supernatural deity theories to tradition and folklore. Alma 30, 48 continued, And I say also that ye do not know that there is a God, and except ye show me a sign, I will not believe. Poor horse teachings, except ye show me a sign, I will not believe. Professor Cochran's teachings, Personally, my own experiences have caused me to develop a philosophy that has its database in more demonstrative evidence than faith responses. The prophet Joseph Smith taught the following about seeking signs. I will give you one of the keys of the mysteries of the kingdom. It is an eternal principle that has existed with God from all eternity. 
that man who rises up to condemn others, finding fault with the church, saying that they are out of the way, while he himself is righteous, then know assuredly that that man is in the high road to apostasy, and if he does not repent, will apostatize as God lives. The principle is as correct as the one that Jesus put forth, saying that he who seeketh the sign is an adulterous person, and that principle is eternal, undeviating, and firm as the pillars of heaven. For whenever you see a man seeking after a sign, you may set it down that he is an adulterous man. Later the prophet noted, when I was preaching in Philadelphia, a Quaker called out for a sign. I told him to be still. After the sermon, he again asked for a sign. I told the congregation the man was an adulterer, that a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and that the Lord had said to me in a revelation that any man who wanted a sign was an adulterous person. It is true, cried one, for I caught him in the very act, which the man afterward confessed when he was baptized. One reason for sign-seeking may be an attempt to gain faith and knowledge without paying the price of humility, seeking earnestly for truth, and obeying the principles of the gospel. In several places in the scriptures, those who do these things are promised that signs will follow. But men like Horhor, who refused to believe and then demand a sign, as the only condition for believing constitute a wicked and adulterous generation. Elder Boyd K. Packer said, In a world filled with skepticism and doubt, the expression seeing is believing promotes the attitude, you show me and I will believe. We want all of the proof and all of the evidence first. It seems hard to take things on faith. When will we learn that in spiritual things it works the other way about? That believing is seeing. Spiritual belief precedes spiritual knowledge. When we believe in things that are not seen, but are nevertheless true, then we have faith. President Joseph F. Smith further explained the dangers of depending on miracles for our faith. Show me Latter-day Saints who have to feed upon miracles, signs, and visions in order to keep them steadfast in the church, and I will show you members of the church who are not in good standing before God, and who are walking in slippery paths. President Joseph F. Smith continued, it is not by marvelous manifestations unto us that we shall be established in truth, but it is by humility and faithful obedience to the commandments and laws of God. When I was a boy, first started out in the ministry, I would frequently go out and ask the Lord to show me some marvelous thing in order that I might receive a testimony. But the Lord withheld marvels from me and showed me the truth, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, until he made me to know the truth from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet, and until doubt and fear had been absolutely purged from me. He did not have to send an angel from the heavens to do this, nor did he have to speak with the trump of an archangel. By the whisperings of the still small voice of the Spirit of the living God, he gave to me the testimony I possess, and by this principle and power he will give to all the children of men a knowledge of the truth, and no amount of marvelous manifestations will ever accomplish this. President Joseph Fielding Smith said a visitation of an angel would not leave the impression that we received through the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. Personal visitations might become dim as time goes on. Note Laman and Lemuel's rationalizations. But this guidance of the Holy Ghost is renewed and continued day after day, year after year, if we live to be worthy of it. Alma 30, 49-51 Now Alma said unto him, This will I give unto thee for a sign, that thou shalt be struck dumb according to my words. And I say, that in the name of God ye shall be struck dumb, that ye shall no more have utterance. Now when Alma had said these words, Korhor was struck dumb, that he could not have utterance, according to the words of Alma. And now when the chief judge saw this, he put forth his hand and wrote unto Korhor, saying, Art thou convinced of the power of God? In whom did ye desire that Alma should show forth his sign? Would ye that he should afflict others to show unto thee a sign? Elder George A. Smith related the following remarkable story. When the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was first founded, you could see persons rise up and ask, What sign will you show us that we may be able to believe? I recollect a Campbellite preacher who came to Joseph Smith. I think his name was Hayden. He came in and made himself known to Joseph and said that he had come to a considerable distance to be convinced of the truth. Why, he said, Mr. Smith, I want to know the truth. And when I am convinced, I will spend all my talents and time in defending and spreading the doctrines of your religion. And I will give you to understand that to convince me is equivalent to convincing all my society, amounting to several hundreds. 
while Joseph commenced laying before him the coming forth of the work and the first principles of the gospel, when Mr. Hayden exclaimed, Oh, this is not the evidence I want. The evidence that I wish to have is a notable miracle. I want to see some powerful manifestation of the power of God. I want to see a notable miracle performed. And if you perform such a one, then I will believe with all my heart and soul. And I will exert all my power and all my extensive influence to convince others. And if you will not perform a miracle of this kind, then I am your worst and bitterest enemy. Well, said Joseph, what will you have done? Will you be struck blind or dumb? Will you be paralyzed, or will you have one hand withered? Take your choice. Choose what you please, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ it shall be done. This is not the kind of miracle I want, said the preacher. Then, sir, replied Joseph, I can perform none. I am not going to bring any trouble upon anybody else, sir, to convince you. Alma 30, 51 continued through 52. Behold, he has showed unto you a sign, and now will you dispute more? And Korhor put forth his hand and wrote, saying, I know that I am dumb, for I cannot speak. And I know that nothing, save it were the power of God, could bring this upon me. Yea, and I always knew that there was a God. To better understand the evils of lying, Robert J. Matthews, a former dean of religion at BYU, explained that the seriousness of lying is not measured only in injury or pain inflicted on the one deceived. Lying has a devastating effect also on the perpetrator. It robs the liar of self-respect and deadens his ability to recognize the difference between truth and error. When a lie is told often enough, even the one who knowingly spread it may begin to believe it. This was the case with the Antichrist Korhor in the Book of Mormon. The Prophet Joseph Smith spoke of the tragedy of individuals like Korhor. Nothing is of greater injury to the children of men than to be under the influence of a false spirit when they think they have the Spirit of God. Alma 30:53. But behold, the devil hath deceived me, for he appeared unto me in the form of an angel, and said unto me, Go and reclaim this people, for they have all gone astray after an unknown God. And he said unto me, There is no God. Yea, and he taught me that which I should say. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Lucifer does not come personally to every false prophet as he did to Korhor, any more than the Lord comes personally to every true prophet as he did to Joseph Smith. Such an appearance, either of God on the one hand, or of Satan on the other, is, however, the end result of full devotion to the respective causes involved. In each instance, an earthly representative, by obedience to the laws that are ordained, may see the face of the master he serves. Alma 30, 53 continued, And I have taught his words, and I have taught them because they were pleasing unto the carnal mind, and I taught them even until I had much success, insomuch that I verily believed that they were true. And for this cause I withstood the truth, even until I have brought this great curse upon me. After being struck dumb, Korhor admitted that he knew there was a God, but that the devil had deceived him. It is interesting that Sherem, another Antichrist, had also admitted that he had been deceived by the power of the devil. How did the devil deceive Korhor? Does Satan have the power to appear as an angel? 2 Corinthians 11, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Doctrine and Covenants 128, and again, what do we hear? Glad tidings from Camorra, Moroni, an angel from heaven, declaring the fulfillment of the prophets, the book to be revealed, a voice of the Lord in the wilderness of Fayette, Seneca County, declaring the three witnesses to bear record of the book, the voice of Michael on the banks of the Susquehanna, detecting the devil when he appeared as an angel of light. The voice of Peter, James, and John in the wilderness between Harmony, Susquehanna County, and Colesville, Broome County, on the Susquehanna River, declaring themselves as possessing the keys of the kingdom and of the dispensation of the fullness of times. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, There are true visions and false ones. Angels appear to men, and so do devils. Manifestly, when a devil appears, he pretends to be an angel and to be delivering a true message from deity. As Jacob describes it, he transformeth himself nigh unto a angel of light. Horhor was one person to whom such an appearance was made. After being struck dumb by the power of God, he wrote this confession. Behold, the devil hath deceived me, for he appeared unto me in the form of an angel, and said unto me, Go and reclaim this people, for they have all gone astray after an unknown God. And he said unto me, There is no God. Yea, and he taught me that which I should say, and I have taught his words, and I taught them because they were pleasing unto the carnal mind. And I taught them, even until I had much success, 
insomuch that I verily believed that they were true, and for this cause I withstood the truth, even until I had brought this great curse upon me. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, There is no doubt about Satan having great power, and that he can appear as an angel of light. In this form he appeared on the banks of the Sesquicahana River to oppose the restoration of keys, and was detected by Michael, and his plans were thwarted. Jacob, son of Lehi, in his teaching, stated that if there had been no atonement, our spirits must have become like unto him, Satan, and we become devils, angels to a devil, to be shut out from the presence of our God, and to remain with the father of lies in misery, like unto himself, yea, to that being, who beguiled our first parents, who transformeth himself nigh unto an angel of light, and stirreth up the children of men unto secret combinations of murder, and all manner of secret works of darkness. Korhor, who tried to deceive the Nephites, admitted that Satan appeared to him as an angel, and told him what to teach the people. When the prophet Joseph Smith and a company of brethren were journeying to Kirtland from Missouri, they camped at McIlwain's Bend on the Missouri River. There, Elder William W. Phelps, in open vision by daylight, saw the destroyer in his most horrible power ride upon the face of the waters. Others heard the noise, but saw not the vision. The Savior declared that Satan had the power to bind bodies of men and women and sorely afflict them. If Satan has power to bind the bodies, he surely must have power to loose them. It should be remembered that Satan has great power and thereby can exercise authority and to some extent control the elements when some greater power does not intervene. Paul, writing to the Ephesian saints, called Satan the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The prophet Joseph Smith said, There have also been ministering angels in the church, which were of Satan, appearing as an angel of light. A sister in the state of New York had a vision, who said it was told her that if she would go to a certain place in the woods, an angel would appear to her. She went at the appointed time and saw a glorious personage descending, arrayed in white with sandy-colored hair. He commenced and told her to fear God, and said that her husband was called to do great things, but that he must not go more than one hundred miles from home, or he would not return. Whereas God had called him to go to the ends of the earth, and he has since been more than a thousand miles from home, and is yet alive. Many true things were spoken by this personage, and many things were false. How, it may be asked, was this known to be a bad angel? By the color of his hair, that is one of the signs that he can be known by and by his contradicting a former revelation. If Satan should appear as one in glory, who can tell his color, his signs, his appearance, his glory, or what is the manner of his manifestation? Who can drag into daylight and develop the hidden mysteries of the false spirits that so frequently are made manifest among the Latter-day Saints? We answer that no man can do this without the priesthood and having a knowledge of the laws by which spirits are governed. For as no man knows the things of God, but by the Spirit of God. So no man knows the spirit of the devil and his power and influence, but by possessing intelligence, which is more than human, and having unfolded it through the medium of the priesthood, the mysterious operations of his devices, without knowing the angelic form, the sanctified look and gesture, the zeal that is frequently manifested by him for the glory of God, together with the prophetic spirit, the gracious influence, the godly appearance, and the holy garb, which are so characteristic of his proceedings and his mysterious windings. A man must have the discerning of spirits before he can drag into daylight this hellish influence and unfold it unto the world in all its soul-destroying diabolical and horrid colors. For nothing is of greater injury to the children of men than to be under the influence of a false spirit when they think they have the spirit of God. When a messenger comes saying he has a message from God, offer him your hand, and request him to shake hands with you. If he be an angel, he will do so, and you will feel his hand. If he be the spirit of a just man, made perfect, he will come in his glory. For that is the only way he can appear. Ask him to shake hands with you, but he will not move, because it is contrary to the order of heaven for a just man to deceive, but he will still deliver his message. If it be the devil as an angel of light, when you ask him to shake hands, he will offer you his hand, and you will not feel anything. You may therefore detect him. These are three grand keys whereby you may know whether any administration is from God. Why was Korhor unable to detect the devil? 
Alma 3053 unmasked Korhor's real reason for teaching that there was no God. Korhor explained that he taught what he did because it was pleasing unto the carnal mind. The word carnal refers to the sensual and worldly desires of man, such as lust and greed, which are contrary to godliness. Why do morality and other virtues often no longer seem important when a belief in God is taken away? To be carnally minded is to focus on physical pleasures or material things rather than on the things of the spirit. It is hard for carnally minded people to experience the things of the spirit. Elder Neil A. Maxwell noted that they are past feeling, having been sedated by pleasing the carnal mind. Alma 30, 54. Now when he had said this, he besought that Alma should pray unto God, that the curse might be taken from him. What did Alma do to counter Korhor's teachings with truth? How can you use these same principles in your life? Like Alma, modern prophets and apostles help us know the difference between truth and Satan's lies. What counsel do you find in these messages? Alma 30, 55-60 But Alma said unto him, If this curse should be taken from thee, thou wouldest again lead away the hearts of this people. Therefore it shall be unto thee even as the Lord will. And it came to pass that the curse was not taken off Korhor. But he was cast out, and went about from house to house begging for his food. Now the knowledge of what had happened unto Korhor was immediately published throughout all the land. Yea, the proclamation was sent forth by the chief judge to all the people in the land. Now the knowledge of what had happened unto Korhor was immediately published throughout all the land. Yea, the proclamation was sent forth by the chief judge to all the people in the land, declaring unto those who had believed in the words of Korhor that they must speedily repent, lest the same judgments would come unto them. And it came to pass that they were all convinced of the wickedness of Korhor. Therefore they were all converted again unto the Lord, and this put an end to the iniquity after the manner of Korhor. And Korhor did go about from house to house, begging food for his support. And it came to pass that as he went forth among the people, yea, among a people who had separated themselves from the Nephites and called themselves Zoramites, being led by a man whose name was Zoram, and as he went forth amongst them, behold, he was run upon and trodden down, even until he was dead. And thus we see the end of him who perverted the ways of the Lord. And thus we see that the devil will not support his children at the last day, but doth speedily drag them down to hell. The Zoramites were a very wicked people, and verse 59 is an example of what the Lord said in Mormon 4.5. It is by the wicked that the wicked are punished. Note Mormon's final commentary on the whole Korhor episode. One can go to many places in society and see the reality of Mormon's prophetic insight. What do you learn from Alma 30, 56 through 60 about how the devil treats his followers? What can you do to protect your home against this influence? See also Alma 36.3, And now, O my son Helaman, behold, thou art in thy youth, and therefore I beseech of thee that thou wilt hear my words and learn of me. For I do know that whosoever shall put their trust in God shall be supported in their trials, and their troubles and their afflictions, and shall be lifted up at the last day. Today is day five for the Come Follow Me study for this week, July 15th through the 21st, the virtue of the word of God. Alma 30 through 31. Friday, July 19th, 2024. Alma 31, 1 through 23. Chapter 31. Alma heads a mission to reclaim the apostate Zoramites. The Zoramites deny Christ, believe in a false concept of election, and worship with set prayers. The missionaries are filled with the Holy Spirit. Their afflictions are swallowed up in the joy of Christ. About 74 BC. Alma encounters the apostate Zoramites. Alma 31.1. Now it came to pass that after the end of Korhor, Alma, having received tidings that the Zoramites were perverting the ways of the Lord, and that Zoram, who was their leader, was leading the hearts of the people to bow down to dumb idols, his heart again began to sicken because of the iniquity of the people. Doctrine and Covenants 1. 
for they have strayed from mine ordinances and have broken my everlasting covenant. They seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, and whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great which shall fall. Isaiah 65 I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that is not good, after their own thoughts. Alma 31, 2-4 For it was the cause of great sorrow to Alma to know of iniquity among his people. Therefore his heart was exceedingly sorrowful because of the separation of the Zoramites from the Nephites. Now the Zoramites had gathered themselves together in a land which they called Antionum, which was east of the land of Zarahemla which lay nearly bordering upon the seashore, which was south of the land of Jershon, which also bordered upon the wilderness south, which wilderness was full of the Lamanites. Now the Nephites greatly feared that the Zoramites would enter into a correspondence with the Lamanites, and that it would be the means of great loss on the part of the Nephites. The Nephites feared that the Zoramites would incite the Lamanites to war, which is what actually happened later. This happens in modern times as well. Leaders in power want war for their own wicked purposes, so they stir up their people through hate campaigns and propaganda to the point where they will go to war. How can you help your children understand that the Word of God is more powerful than anything else? Consider asking them to think of something or someone powerful, or show pictures of a few powerful things. What makes them powerful? Alma 31.5 And now... As the preaching of the word had a great tendency to lead the people to do that which was just, yea, it had had more powerful effect upon the minds of the people than the sword, or anything else, which had happened unto them. Therefore Alma thought it was expedient that they should try the virtue of the word of God. Ask your children what they think this verse means. Elder Henry B. Eyring said, The word of God is the doctrine taught by Jesus Christ and his prophets. Alma knew that words of doctrine had great power. They can open the minds of people to see spiritual things not visible to the natural eye, and they can open the heart to feelings of the love of God and a love for truth. Truth can prepare its own way. Simply hearing the words of doctrine can plant the seeds of faith in the heart, and even a tiny seed of faith in Jesus Christ invites the Spirit. Share an experience when the Word of God had a powerful influence on you. The problem of the Zoramites separating from the Nephites may have seemed to some like it needed a political or military solution, but Alma had learned to trust the virtue of the Word of God. What do you learn from Alma 31.5 about the power of God's Word? The virtue or power of the Word of God is in part explained by the fact that it is attended by the witness of the Spirit. The Lord said that when His words are conveyed by His Spirit, they are His voice and His words. Such words bring comfort to the righteous and remorse of conscience to the wicked, and do indeed have a most profound effect upon the minds of men. Thus, there is virtue in them. Alma considered resorting to preaching the word to the apostate Zormites, even though they had already heard and rejected it. President Boyd K. Packer explained one reason why we must learn the doctrines of the kingdom. True doctrine understood changes attitudes and behavior. The study of the doctrines of the gospel will improve behavior quicker than a study of behavior will improve behavior. That is why we stress so forcefully the study of the doctrines of the gospel. Elder Marion G. Romney said, There are no armaments, no governmental schemes, no international organizations and no mechanisms for the control of weapons which can preserve an unrighteous people. Alma has given us compelling evidence of his conviction that repentance is more effectual than arms in maintaining peace. You will recall that he was the elected chief judge of the Nephite nation. As such, he was the governor of the people of Nephi and commander-in-chief of their armies, seeing many of them dissenting and conniving with the enemy. He, notwithstanding his power to strengthen and command his armies, placed the affairs of state in other hands that he himself might cry repentance unto the dissenters. President Spencer W. Kimball spoke of the power of scriptures to help us draw nearer to God. I find that when I get casual in my relationships with deity, and when it seems that no divine ear is listening, and no divine voice is speaking, that I am far, far away. 
If I immerse myself in the scriptures, the distance narrows and the spirituality returns. I find myself loving more intensely those who I must love with all my heart and mind and strength, and loving them more. I find it easier to abide their counsel. President Ezra Taft Benson explained how the scriptures can be a powerful way to bless us and answer the difficult questions of life. Often we spend great effort in trying to increase the activity levels in our stakes. We work diligently to raise the percentages of those attending sacrament meetings. We labor to get a higher percentage of our young men on missions. We strive to improve the numbers of those marrying in the temple. All of these are commendable efforts and important to the growth of the kingdom. But when individual members and families immerse themselves in the scriptures regularly and consistently, these other areas of activity will automatically come. Testimonies will increase. Commitment will be strengthened. Families will be fortified. Personal revelation will flow. According to Alma, why is the preaching of the word so powerful? How does this help explain why daily scripture study is so important? As you study Alma 31, what other gospel truths can you find that apply to your life experiences? For example, how have you seen the word of God lead people to do good things? Alma 31, 6, Therefore he took Ammon and Aaron and Omner, and Himni he did leave in the church in Zarahemla, but the former three he took with him, and also Amulek and Zeezrom, who were at Melek, and he also took two of his sons. Notice the group of people Alma took with him to teach the gospel to the Zoramites. What do you learn about the lives of these people? What message might there be for you in their experiences? Alma 31, 7. Now the eldest of his sons he took not with him, and his name was Helaman. But the names of those whom he took with him were Shiblon and Corianton. And these are the names of those who went with him among the Zoramites to preach unto them the word. The errors of the Zoramites described. Alma 31, 8 through 9. Now the Zoramites were dissenters from the Nephites, therefore they had had the word of God preached unto them. But they had fallen into great errors, for they would not observe to keep the commandments of God and his statutes according to the law of Moses. Elder Brewster McConkie said, We cannot always tell whether specific sacrificial rites performed in Israel were part of the Mosaic system, or whether they were the same ordinances performed by Adam and Abraham as part of the gospel law itself. Further, it appears that some of the ritualistic performances varied from time to time, according to the special needs of the people and the changing circumstances in which they found themselves. Even the Book of Mormon does not help us in these respects. We know the Nephites offered sacrifices and kept the law of Moses. Since they held the Melchizedek priesthood, and there were no Levites among them, we suppose their sacrifices were those that antedated the ministry of Moses and that, since they had the fullness of the gospel itself, they kept the law of Moses in the sense that they conformed to its myriad moral principles and its endless ethical restrictions. We suppose this would be one of the reasons why Nephi was able to say, The law hath become dead unto us. There is at least no intimation in the Book of Mormon that the Nephites offered the daily sacrifices required by the law, or that they held the various feasts that were part of the religious life of their old world kinsmen. Alma 31, 10-11 Neither would they observe the performances of the church to continue in prayer and supplication to God daily, that they might not enter into temptation. Yea, in fine, they did pervert the ways of the Lord in very many instances. Therefore, for this cause, Alma and his brethren went into the land to preach the word unto them. In Antionum, the missionary force of Alma and his companions came across a group of Nephite dissenters known as the Zoramites. Mormon not only recorded that the Zoramites had previously had the word of God preached unto them, but he further identified the cause of their apostasy. They would not keep the commandments. They no longer petitioned the Lord daily in prayer. They perverted the ways of the Lord. And what prayers they did offer to the Lord were vain and meaningless. They ignored the basics such as having a daily habit of meaningful prayer and scripture study. Elder Donald L. Staheli of the Seventy emphasized the importance of daily consistency in the basics of the gospel. 
Daily frequent prayers seeking forgiveness and special help and direction are essential to our lives and the nourishment of our testimonies. When we become hurried, repetitive, casual, or forgetful in our prayers, we tend to lose the closeness of the Spirit, which is so essential to the continual direction we need to successfully manage the challenges of our everyday lives. Family prayer every morning and night adds additional blessings and power to our individual prayers and to our testimonies. Personal, sincere involvement in the scriptures produces faith, hope, and solutions to our daily challenges. Frequently reading, pondering, and applying the lessons of the scriptures combined with prayer become an irreplaceable part of gaining and sustaining a strong, vibrant testimony. Alma 31, 12 through 14. Now, when they had come into the land, behold, to their astonishment, they found that the Zoramites had built synagogues, and that they did gather themselves together on one day of the week, which day they did call the day of the Lord, and they did worship after a manner which Alma and his brethren had never beheld. For they had a place built up in the center of their synagogue, a place for standing, which was high above the head, and the top thereof would only admit one person. Therefore, whosoever desired to worship must go forth and stand upon the top thereof, and stretch forth his hands towards heaven, and cry with a loud voice, saying, The thing that disturbs me more than anything else, said Hal, is how Professor Cochrane degrades Christianity. It's not the Christianity in which we believe. This is one of the favorite approaches of the philosopher who is antagonistic to Christianity. He sets up a straw man so he can knock them down with his arguments. Bertrand Russell uses this technique frequently. He drew emphasis from perverted apostate Christianity, but ignored the Christianity of the Savior. You see, true Christianity has had its perversions in every age. Interestingly, one of the great perversions of Christianity in the Book of Mormon follows the chapter of Korhor. It deals with the Zoramites. This Antichrist movement also has its modern counterparts. Let's look at some examples. Alma 31, 15-17 Holy, holy God, we believe that thou art God, and we believe that thou art holy, and that thou wast a spirit, and that thou art a spirit, and that thou wilt be a spirit forever. Holy God, we believe that thou hast separated us from our brethren, and we do not believe in the tradition of our brethren, which was handed down to them by the childish of their fathers. But we believe that thou hast in but we believe that thou hast elected us to be thy holy children, and also thou hast made it known unto us that there shall be no Christ. But thou art the same yesterday, today, and forever, and thou hast elected us that we shall be saved whilst all around us are elected to be cast by thy wrath down to hell. For the which holiness, O God, we thank thee. Hugh Nibley said, These lessons have always been hard for the Latter-day Saints to learn, and it is clear from the words of Brigham Young that we still have a long way to go. There are a few absolute and categorical thou shalt nots in the scriptures, which we are far from taking to heart. We have been told that under no circumstances are we to contend, accuse, coerce, aspire, or flatter. These practices will be readily recognized as standard procedure in getting to the top in our modern competitive society. What all of them have in common is a feeling of self-righteousness. Next to covetousness, it was self-righteousness against which Joseph and Brigham most urgently warned the saints. Let not any man publish his own righteousness said the prophet Joseph, not even, one might add, in testimony meeting. Don't be limited in your views with regard to your neighbor's virtue, but beware of self-righteousness, and be limited in the estimate of your own virtues. You must enlarge your souls towards each other. As you increase in innocence and virtue, as you increase in goodness, let your hearts expand. Let them be enlarged towards others. You must not be contracted, but you must be liberal in your feelings. Christ was condemned by the self-righteous Jews because he took sinners into a society. All the religious world is boasting of righteousness. It is the doctrine of the devil to retard the human mind and hinder our progress by filling us with self-righteousness. We are full of selfishness. The devil flatters us that we are very righteous when we are feeding on the faults of others. President Hubie Brown said the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches the universality of God's concern for men and that obedience is a universal and fundamental law of progress, both temporal and spiritual. 
The aristocracy of righteousness is the only aristocracy that God recognizes. This leaves no room for self-righteous expressions in words or actions of being holier than thou. There is a real unity in the human race, and all men have a right to equal consideration as human beings, regardless of their race, creed, or color. For any church, country, nation, or other group to believe that it is the only people in whom God is interested, or that it has special merit because of color, race, or belief, that they are inherently superior and loved by God without regard to the lives they live, is not only a great and dangerous fallacy, but is a continuing barrier to peace. This is demoralizing whether it is the exploited or presumptuous myth of an Aryan race of supermen or disguised in more subtle forms. Let us steadfastly avoid such demoralizing arrogance. Alma 31, 17 continued through 18. And we also thank thee that thou hast elected us, that we may not be led away after the foolish traditions of our brethren, which doth bind them down to a belief of Christ, which doth lead their hearts to wander far from thee, O God. And again we thank thee, O God, that we are a chosen and a holy people. Amen. We do not have much information on the origin of the Zoramites. Alma 30, 59 indicates that the Zoramites had dissented from the Nephites under the leadership of a man named Zoram. The following is a summary of what we know about their apostate condition. They did not observe the law of Moses. They had forsaken daily prayer. They perverted the ways of the Lord. They built synagogues for the purpose of worshiping one day a week. They built a prayer stand from which they offered the same prayer. They believed God was and would always be a spirit. They believed the traditional beliefs of the Nephites were false. They believed there would be no Christ. They believed they were chosen to be the elect of God. Today there are those who have also fallen into similar false practices. Unless we are careful to guard against it, we too could fall into some of the same traps of routine prayers, worshiping only weekly during the two-hour block, and not thinking of God again during the week, only praying in a set place, or becoming materialistic and prideful. In what ways might our prayers be similar to the Zoramites' prayers? Briefly summarize the story of Alma and the Zoramites using verses from Alma 31, 8-35. Help your children identify things the Zoramites said in their prayer. As they help you build a Ramiumpton tower with blocks or rocks, explain that this is not how we should pray. As you and your children talk about how we should pray, let them remove the blocks or rocks one at a time. Maybe they could keep one of the rocks at their bed as a reminder to pray every morning and night. They might enjoy decorating their rock. Alma 31, 19 through 20. Now it came to pass that after Alma and his brethren and his sons had heard these prayers, they were astonished beyond all measure. For behold, every man did go forth and offer up these same prayers. Matthew 6. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. Elder Charles W. Penrose said, It seems that many who have accepted the Christian religion act as if they expected to be heard because of their many words. They also use what here are called vain repetitions. Now prayer is not acceptable for its rhetoric. It is that which comes from the heart, the sincere sentiment, the secret feeling, which ascends to our Father, and which he who sees in secret will reward it openly. It is not a multitude of words and repetitions that is pleasing to the Lord, but the earnest desire of a humble heart. And this will be answered no matter how broken or ungrammatical the language may be. On the other hand, no matter how flowery the language of the petition may be, if it does not convey the feelings of the heart, it is not true prayer. Alma 31, 21. Now the place was called by them Ramiemptum, which being interpreted is the Holy Stand. Peace to you, sir. And again, we thank thee, O God, 
that we are a chosen and a holy people. Amen. Holy, holy God, we believe that thou art God, and we believe that thou art holy. The Zoramites bow down to idols. They have fallen into grave errors and no longer keep the commandments of God. They pervert the ways of the Lord. We also fear that they will enter into a correspondence with the Lamanites, which would be the means of a great loss for us. What should we do? The preaching of the word has a great tendency to lead the people to do that which is just. It has had more powerful effect upon the minds of the people than the sword or anything else. Let us try the virtue of the word of God. Now from this stand they did offer up every man the selfsame prayer unto God, thanking their God that they were chosen of him, and that he did not lead them away after the tradition of their brethren, and that their hearts were not stolen away to believe in the things to come which they knew nothing about. Even though the Zoramites killed Korhor, they seem to have adopted a similar belief system. Note the following phrases from Alma 31 that describe the Zoramite beliefs. They had fallen into great errors. They had rejected traditions that they felt were handed down by the childish of their fathers. They did not want to be led away after the foolish traditions of their brethren, which doth bind them down to a belief of Christ. They refused to believe in things to come, which they knew nothing about. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland commented on Korhor's influence on the Zoramites' false teachings. Korhor's brand of teaching inevitably had its influence among some of the less faithful, who, like the neighboring Zoramites, were already given to perverting the ways of the Lord. Zoram and his followers are one of the most memorable apostate groups mentioned in the Book of Mormon, primarily because they considered themselves so unusually righteous. Once a week they stood atop a prayer tower called a Ramiemptum, and using always the self-same prayer, thanked God that they were better than everyone else. A chosen and a holy people, elected by God, to be saved while all around them were equally elected to be cast down to hell. In the reassuring safety of all this, they were also spared any belief in such foolish traditions, evidence of Korhor's legacy emerging here, as a belief in a Savior, for it had been made known to them there should be no Christ. 
Alma lost little time encountering such unholy prayer and its equally unholy theology with his own prayer for divine assistance against this form of self-serving iniquity that made him literally sick at heart. Alma 31, 23. Now after the people had all offered up thanks after this manner, they returned to their homes, never speaking to their God again, until they had assembled themselves together again to the holy stand to offer up thanks after their manner. Doctrine and Covenants 59. That thou mayest more fully keep thyself unspotted from the world, thou shalt go to the house of prayer and offer up thy sacraments upon my holy day. For verily this is a day appointed unto you to rest from your labors and to pay thy devotions unto the Most High. Nevertheless, thy vows shall be offered up in righteousness on all days and at all times. Elder William H. Reeder said, if it were my prerogative to preach a sermon, I would like to cry out against the hypocrisy that seems to prevail among some of our members. I am sure there is no greater offense against the Holy Ghost than insincerity, inconsistency, and hypocrisy. The Savior denounced it most vehemently. It does not get any of us who do not practice what we preach and profess to be anywhere or anything. Those who are true and loyal are the ones who reap the benefits. The prophet Joseph Smith said, I love that man better who swears a stream as long as my arm, yet deals justice to his neighbor and mercifully deals his substance to the poor than the long, smooth-faced hypocrite. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, Values that are unassimilated into home life obviously fail to touch the major portion of our lives and therefore cannot help us either in that most important laboratory of all, the laboratory of our families. But when our homes help us to be compassionate and selfless, then we have a school on whose graduates all of society depends. I'm beginning to get the perspective, said Hal. That's why the Lord left us the records of scriptures, so that we might profit from the experiences of past generations. I certainly have profited. That class really had me shook up. But you know, even though these things brought me to grips with a lot of questions I couldn't answer, I just seemed to sense that what was being said couldn't be right. It's important to cultivate that sense, Hal. It is personal testimony that is so vital and discerning between true and erroneous teachings. Remember Alma's reliance on personal testimony? The Lord has indicated to us how we can make this important determination concerning all men's teachings. Again in the Book of Mormon we read, For behold, my brethren, it is given unto you to judge, that ye may know good from evil. And the way to judge is as plain, that ye may know with a perfect knowledge as the daylight is from the dark night. For behold, the Spirit of Christ is given to every man, that he may know good from evil. Wherefore, I show unto you the way to judge. For everything which inviteth to do good and to persuade to believe in Christ is sent forth by the power and gift of Christ. Wherefore, ye may know with a perfect knowledge it is of God. But whatsoever thing persuadeth men to do good and believe not in Christ and deny him and serve not God, then ye may know with a perfect knowledge it is of the devil. For after this manner doth the devil work, for he persuadeth no man to do good, no, not one, neither do his angels, neither do they who subject themselves unto him. You see, Hal, there is a way that you can determine the truth of a man's philosophies. President Joseph F. Smith has said, I know that this is the work of God, and he is carrying it on. The honor of triumph over error, sin, and injustice will belong to God, and not to you or me or any other man. Some men there will be who would limit the power of God to the power of men, and we have some of these among us, and they have been among our school teachers. They would have you disbelieve the inspired accounts of the scriptures, that the winds and the waves are subject to the power of God, and believe the claim of the Savior to cast out devils, raise the dead, or perform miraculous things, such as cleansing the leper, is only a myth. They would make you believe that God and his son Jesus Christ did not appear in person to Joseph Smith, that this was simply a myth. But we know better. The testimony of the Spirit has testified that this is the truth. And I say, beware of men who come to you with heresies that things come by laws of nature of themselves, and that God is without power. President Joseph F. Smith continued, among the Latter-day Saints, the preaching of false doctrines disguised as truths of the gospel may be expected from people of two classes, and particularly from these only, they are first the hopelessly ignorant, whose lack of intelligence is due to their indolence and sloth. 
who make but feeble effort, if indeed any at all, to better themselves by reading and studying. Those who are afflicted with a dread disease that may develop into an incurable malady laziness. Second, the proud and self-vaunting ones who read by the lamp of their own conceit, who interpret by rules of their own contriving, who have become a law unto themselves and so pose as the sole judges of their own doings, more dangerously ignorant than the first. Beware of the lazy and the proud. Their infection in each case is contagious. Better for them and for all when they are compelled to display the yellow flag of warning that the clean and uninfected may be protected. What is the source of truth for Latter-day Saints? Elder Mark E. Peterson said, We must in our line of work avoid sectarianism, avoid the philosophies and doctrines of men, which were so denounced by the Lord in the first vision to the prophet Joseph Smith. Just because we have an avid desire for learning is no reason why we can set to one side any of the things which the Lord has said and decide that some worldly cleric is a greater authority. And we must determine to avoid bringing sectarianism into our instruction. That is vital. As teachers in this great church, we must hold to our one fundamental premise. We must never depart from it. We must talk to the one and only concept of the gospel and in it there can be no variance. We cannot take liberties with it, not even under the guise of academic freedom. For in teaching the gospel, there is no academic freedom. I would like to repeat that. In teaching the gospel, there is no academic freedom. There's only fundamental orthodox doctrine and truth. Perhaps, as you have studied about Howe's experience with Professor Cochran, you have discovered that the greatest defense against the false teachings of the world is a firm testimony in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of what vital truths do we need to have a testimony? Consider these words of President J. Reuben Clark, Jr. There are for the church and for each and all of its members two prime things which may not be overlooked, forgotten, shaded, or discarded. First, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father in the flesh, that he died, that he was raised from the tomb as a resurrected being, and that because of his death and by and through his resurrection, every man born into the world since the beginning will be likewise literally resurrected. The second is that the Father and the Son actually and in truth and very deed appeared to the prophet Joseph in a vision in the woods, that other heavenly visions followed, that the gospel and the holy priesthood were in truth and fact restored, that the Lord again set up his church, that the Book of Mormon is just what it professes to be, that the prophet's successors have received revelations, as the needs of the church have required. Any individual who does not accept the fullness of these doctrines as to Jesus of Nazareth or as to the restoration of the gospel and holy priesthood is not a Latter-day Saint. How can one gain a testimony and keep it strong? 1. Alma 5, 45, 46. What principles can enable us to both acquire and maintain a testimony? And this is not all. Do ye not suppose that I know of these things myself? Behold, I testify unto you that I do know that these things whereof I have spoken are true. And how do ye suppose that I know of their surety? Behold, I say unto you, they are made known unto me by the Holy Spirit of God. Behold, I have fasted and prayed many days that I might know these things for myself. And now I do know of myself that they are true, for the Lord God hath made them manifest unto me by his Spirit. And this is the Spirit of Revelation which is in me. 2. Mosiah 4.11. What counsel does King Benjamin give for nourishing and strengthening your testimony? And again I say unto you, as I have said before, that as ye have come to the knowledge of the glory of God, or ye have known of his goodness, and have tasted of his love, and have received a remission of your sins, which causeth such exceedingly great joy in your souls, even so I would that ye should remember and always retain in remembrance the greatness of God and your own nothingness, and his goodness, and long-suffering towards you, unworthy creatures, and humble yourselves even in the depths of humility, calling on the name of the Lord daily, and standing steadfastly in the faith of that which is to come, which was spoken by the mouth of the angel. 3. Moroni 6, 4-7 What further counsel is given to us individually and collectively to maintain a testimony? And after they had been received unto baptism, and were wrought upon and cleansed by the power of the Holy Ghost, they were numbered among the people of the Church of Christ, and their names were taken, 
that they might be remembered and nourished by the good word of God, to keep them in the right way, to keep them continually watchful unto prayer, relying only upon the merits of Christ, who was the author and the finisher of their faith. And the church did meet together oft, to fast and to pray, and to speak one with another concerning the welfare of their souls. And they did meet together oft, to partake of bread and wine, in remembrance of the Lord Jesus. And they were strict to observe that there should be no iniquity among them, and whoso was found to commit iniquity. And three witnesses of the church did condemn them before the elders, and if they repented not, and confessed not, their names were blotted out, and they were not numbered among the people of Christ. A testimony of the Book of Mormon can be an anchor against the waves and skepticism of, and doubt. President Harold B. Lee said, Today is a day of clever deception, a day when the Master declared one of the signs of his coming should be that even the very elect, according to the covenant, would be deceived. One of our boys, now studying in a large university on the coast, declared that the thing that had kept him from losing faith in the Bible, which the higher critics have decimated um, almost to a point of non-recognition he said the thing that has kept my faith is that i know the book of mormon is true and because of that testimony i know that what they are saying about the bible is false and not the truth the lord has given us a sure guide as to how we might discern truth from error he said and that which doth not edify is not of god that which is of god is light and he that receiveth light and continueth in god receiveth more light and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. President Ezra Taft Benson said, there is power in the Book of Mormon, which will begin to flow into your lives the moment you begin a serious study of the book. You will find greater power to resist temptation. You will find the power to avoid deception. You will find the power to stay on the straight and narrow path. Today is day six for the Come Follow Me study for this week, July 15th through the 21st. The Virtue of the Word of God, Alma 30-31 through 31. Saturday, July 20th, 2024, Alma 31, 24-38 Alma's Prayer in Behalf of the Zoramites, Alma 31, 24-28 Now when Alma saw this, his heart was grieved, for he saw that they were a wicked and a perverse people. Yea, he saw that their hearts were set upon gold, and upon silver, and upon all manner of fine goods. Yea, and he also saw that their hearts were lifted up unto great boasting, in their pride. And he lifted up his voice to heaven and cried, saying, O oh, how long, O Lord, wilt thou suffer that thy servants shall dwell here below in the flesh, to behold such gross wickedness among the children of men? Behold, O God, they cry unto thee, and yet their hearts are swallowed up in their pride. Behold, O God, they cry unto thee with their mouths, while they are puffed up even to greatness with the vain things of the world. Behold, O oh my God, their costly apparel, and their ringlets, and their bracelets, and their ornaments of gold, and all their precious things which they are ornamented with. And behold, their hearts are set upon them. And yet they cry unto thee, and say, We thank thee, O God, for we are a chosen people unto thee, while others shall perish. Hugh Nibley said, The wickedest people in the Book of Mormon are the Zoramites, a proud, independent, courageous, industrious, enterprising, patriotic, prosperous people who attended strictly to their weekly religious duties with the proper observance of dress standards, thanking God for all he had given them. They bore testimony to his goodness. They were sustained in all their doings by a perfectly beautiful self-image. Well, what is wrong with all of that? There is just one thing that spoils it all, and that is they are really thinking of something else. Behold, O oh my God, their costly apparel and their precious things, their hearts are set upon them, and yet they cry unto thee, and say, We thank thee, O God, for we are a chosen people unto thee, while others shall perish. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf said, When our hearts are filled with pride, we commit a grave sin, for we violate the two great commandments. Instead of worshiping God and loving our neighbor, we reveal the real object of our worship and love, the image we see in the mirror. Pride is the great sin of self-elevation. It is for so many a personal ramiumpton, a holy stand that justifies envy, greed, and vanity. God the Eternal Father did not give that first great commandment because he needs us to love him. His power and glory are not diminished should we disregard, deny, or even defile his name. His influence and dominion extend through time and space independent of our acceptance, approval, or admiration. No, God does not need us to love him, but oh, we need to love God. For what we love 
determines what we seek. What we seek determines what we think and do. What we think and do determines who we are and who we will become. President Gord B. Hinckley cautioned us against pride. We must be humble before the Lord. He has so declared, and if we do it, he will hear our prayers and answer them with the blessing upon our heads. Alma 31, 29-30 Yea, and they say that thou hast made it known unto them that there shall be no Christ. When Alma saw the apostate condition of the Zoramites, he knew what their problem was. According to verses 24-29, through 29, why do people often invent their own forms of worship? Alma 31, 30-31 O Lord God, how long wilt thou suffer that such wickedness and infidelity shall be among this people? O Lord, wilt thou give me strength that I may bear with mine affirmities? For I am infirm, and such wickedness among this people doth pain my soul. O Lord, my heart is exceedingly sorrowful. Wilt thou comfort my soul in Christ? O Lord, wilt thou grant unto me that I may have strength, that I may suffer with patience these afflictions, which shall come upon me because of the iniquity of this people? Elder Kent F. Richard said, Opposition is part of Heavenly Father's plan of happiness. We all encounter enough to bring us to an awareness of our Father's love and of our need of the Savior's help. The Savior is not a silent observer. He himself knows personally and infinitely the pain we face. Sometimes in the depth of pain we are tempted to ask, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? I testify the answer is yes, there is a physician. The atonement of Jesus Christ covers all these conditions and purposes of mortality. Alma 31, 32 O Lord, wilt thou comfort my soul, and give unto me success, and also my fellow laborers who are with me, yea, Ammon, and Aaron, and Omner, and also Amulek, and Zeezrom, and also my two sons? Yea, even all these wilt thou comfort, O Lord, yea, wilt thou comfort their souls in Christ? Note in verses 30-35 through 35, Alma's prayer for his companions and the success of their mission. It was during this mission that Alma's son Corianton fell to the seductive temptations of the harlot Isabel. Alma 31, 33. Wilt thou grant unto them that they may have strength, that they may bear their afflictions, which shall come upon them because of the iniquities of this people? President Lorenzo Snow spoke of the blessings that come through tribulation. I suppose I am talking to some who have had worry and trouble and heart burnings and persecution and have at times been caused to think that they never expected to endure quite so much. But for everything you have suffered, for everything that has occurred to you, which you thought an evil at that time, you will receive fourfold. And that suffering will have had a tendency to make you better and stronger and to feel that you have been blessed. When you look back over your experiences, you will then see that you have advanced far ahead and have gone up several rounds of the ladder toward exaltation and glory. Take it individually or take it collectively. We have suffered and we shall have to suffer again. And why? because the Lord requires it at our hands for our sanctification. Alma 31, 34-35 O Lord, wilt thou grant unto us that we may have success in bringing them again unto thee in Christ? Behold, O Lord, their souls are precious. Doctrine and Covenants 18 Remember the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. The prophet Joseph Smith said, Souls are as precious in the sight of God as they ever were, and the elders were never called to drive any down to hell, but to persuade and invite all men everywhere to repent, that they may become the heirs of salvation. Doctrine and Covenants 109 O Lord, we delight not in the destruction of our fellow men. Their souls are precious before thee. Alma 31, 35 continued. And many of them are our brethren. Therefore give unto us, O Lord, power and wisdom, that we may bring these our brethren again unto thee. My heart is grieved. They are wicked and a perverse people. Their hearts are set upon gold, silver, and upon all manner of fine goods. They worship in a manner which I have never beheld. Their hearts are lifted up in a great boasting in their pride. Oh, how long, O oh Lord, wilt thou suffer that thy servants shall dwell here below in the flesh? to behold such gross wickedness among the children of men. O oh Lord, my heart is exceedingly sorrowful. Wilt 
thou comfort my soul in Christ? Lord, wilt thou grant unto me that I may have strength, that I may suffer with patience these afflictions which shall come upon me because of the iniquity of this people? O oh Lord, wilt thou comfort my soul and give unto me success and also my fellow laborers who are with me? Yea, wilt thou comfort their souls in Christ? Wilt thou grant unto them that they may have strength, that they may bear their afflictions which shall come upon them because of the iniquities of this people? O Lord, wilt thou grant unto us that we may have success in bringing them again unto thee in Christ? O Lord, their souls are precious, and many of them are our brethren. Therefore give unto us, O Lord, power and wisdom, that we may bring these our brethren again unto thee. Alma recognized that the souls of the apostate Zoramites were precious to God. Thus Alma prayed for the power and wisdom to bring them back to the Lord. Alma's prayer exemplifies the attitude all members and missionaries must develop. All people are of great worth, and through the power of God they can be brought back to him. While serving as a member of the 70, Elder Carlos E. A. C. taught that all people are precious to God and should be to us. The souls of our brothers and sisters, who may seem to be more feeble and less honorable, are precious. The church has need of them. We should make every attempt to know them and to help them claim the full blessings and joys of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our prayers should be as Alma's. Give unto us, O Lord, power and wisdom, that we may bring these, our brethren, again unto thee. We must remember that our salvation is intertwined with the salvation of others. We must care more for those who seem to care less for their faith. What do we learn about how a disciple of Christ should feel toward his or her fellow men? Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, Petitioning Heavenly Father for the blessings we desire in our personal lives is good and proper. However, praying earnestly for others, both those whom we love and those who despitefully use us, is also an important element of meaningful prayer. Prayers for others with all of the energy of our souls increases our capacity to hear and to heed the voice of the Lord. Compare Alma's attitudes, feelings, and actions regarding others with those of the Zormites. How can you be more like Alma? Alma seemed to be motivated to reclaim the Zoramites out of love of God and love of the Zoramites. How can we develop this same kind of love? How was Alma's prayer different from the Zoramites' prayer? How might our prayers be similar to Alma's prayers? Alma 31, 36 to 37. Now it came to pass that when Alma had said these words, that he clapped his hands upon all them who were with him. And behold, as he clapped his hands upon them, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And after they had separated themselves one from another, taking no thought for themselves, what they should eat, or what they should drink, or what they should put on. Doctrine and Covenants 84. Any man that shall go and preach his gospel of the kingdom, and fail not to continue faithful in all things, shall not be weary in mind, neither darkened, neither in body, limb, nor joint, and a hair of his head shall not fall to the ground unnoticed, and they shall not go hungry, neither athirst. Therefore take ye no thought for the morrow, for what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, and whither all ye shall be clothed. Neither take ye thought beforehand what ye shall say, but treasureth up in your minds continually the words of life, and it shall be given you in the very hour that portion that shall be meted unto every man. Alma thirty one thirty eight, And the Lord provided for them that they should hunger not, neither should they thirst. Yea, and he also gave them strength, that they should suffer no manner of afflictions, save it were swallowed up in the joy of Christ. Now this was according to the prayer of Alma, and this because he prayed in faith. James 1. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. James 5. Pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. 
President James E. Faust said, I humbly come to this pulpit today to speak about a sure cure for heartache, disappointment, torment, anguish, and despair. The Psalms is stated, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. The healing is a divine miracle. The wounds are a common lot of all mankind. Shakespeare has said, He jests at scars that never felt a wound. It seems that no one escapes the troubles, challenges, and disappointments of this world. Some way, somehow, we must find the healing influence that brings solace to the soul. Where is this balm? Where is the compensating relief so desperately needed to help us survive in the world's pressures? The onset comfort in large measure can come through increased communion with the Spirit of God. This can bring spiritual healing. We find solace in Christ through the agency of the Comforter, and He extends His invitation to us. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Apostle Paul speaks of casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. As we do this, healing takes place, just as the Lord promised through the prophet Jeremiah when he said, I will turn their mornings into joy, and will comfort them, and make them rejoice from their sorrow. I have satiated the weary soul, and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. In the celestial glory, we are told, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Then faith and hope will replace heartache, disappointment, torment, anguish, and despair, and the Lord will give us strength. As Alma says, that we should suffer no more of afflictions, save it were swallowed up in the joy of Christ. Of this I have a testimony, and I so declare it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, Jesus, who bore the greatest and heaviest burdens, knows how to help his followers absorb afflictions in a unique way. And the Lord provided for them that they should hunger not, neither should they thirst. Yea, and he also gave them strength that they should suffer no manner of afflictions, save it were swallowed up in the joy of Christ. Now this was according to the prayer of Alma, and this because he prayed in faith. Even so, we will not be free of affliction, but we will be given help in bearing affliction, especially if our wills are swallowed up in the will of the Father in Christ. Being swallowed up in the will of God can help us cope not only with afflictions, but even with death. It is noteworthy that this particular prophet Alma, while trying to reactivate people, was efficient because he was determined to try the virtue of the word of God, the very approach which has a great tendency to lead the people to do that which is just, Having faith in Christ includes having faith in the assurance that our trials and difficulties are but a small moment, even when at the moment they seem to us to be extended and unremitting. Faith includes having faith in God's timing. As we see the valiant reach breaking points without breaking, it inspires the rest of us to trust in the divine design in our own circumstances, which may not be immediately apparent to us during our trials. We cannot behold with our natural eyes for the present time the design of our God, and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. <clears throat> Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, Why is non-endurance a denial of the Lord? Because giving up is a denial of the Lord's loving capacity to see us through all these things. Giving up suggests that God is less than he really is. So much of life's curriculum consists of efforts by the Lord to get and keep our attention. Ironically, the stimuli he uses are often that which is seen by us, as something to endure. Sometimes what we are being asked to endure is his help, help to draw us away from the cares of the world, help to draw us away from self-centeredness. Attention getting help when the still small voice has been ignored by us, help in the shaping of our souls, and help to keep the promises we made so long ago to him and to ourselves. Whether the afflictions are self-induced as most of them are, or whether they are of the divine tutorial type, it matters not. Either way, the Lord can help us so that our afflictions, said Alma, can be swallowed up in the joy of Christ. Thus, afflictions are endured and are overcome by joy. The sour notes are lost amid a symphony of salvational sounds. Our afflictions, brothers and sisters, may not be extinguished. Instead, they can be dwarfed and swallowed up in the joy of Christ. This is how we overcome most of the time not the elimination of affliction, but the placing of these in their larger context. Elder Dale G. Renland said, when faced with unfairness, we can push ourselves away from God or we can be drawn toward him for help and support. Do not let unfairness harden you or corrode your faith in God. Instead, ask God for help 
Increase your appreciation for and reliance on the Savior. Rather than becoming bitter, let him help you become better. Allow him to help you persevere, to let your afflictions be swallowed up in the joy of Christ. Join him in his mission to heal the brokenhearted. Strive to mitigate unfairness and become a stone catcher. What do you find in Alma 31, 30-38 that can help people who sorrow for the sins of others?